Right. Well, I think perhaps without further ado, I think we'll make a start. Good evening. My name is Jeffrey Michaels, and I'm the IEN Senior Fellow at eBay. I'd like to welcome you to eBay's seminar series on U.S. foreign policy. The series is part of a joint initiative of eBay and the Barcelona Institute of North American Studies that aims to promote discussion of U.S. foreign policy related topics by inviting scholars from the social sciences and humanities, as well as practitioners to share their research and provide their insights. This evening, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Professor Sarah Snyder, who will be speaking on the evolution of U.S. human rights policy, a topic that in the last four years of the Trump administration took a major hit, certainly in terms of the rhetoric, if not the practice. Now, with the Biden administration referring to human rights as being at the center of U.S. foreign policy, the rhetoric seems to have returned, but what about the actual practice? What is the standard of U.S. practice in this area with which we can judge and differentiate one administration's policy from the next? And do political administrations really even matter? And what about the broader context of human rights as a, as a theme in the evolution of international society and international politics? To what extent has U.S. policy driven developments in this area or been driven by them? So to get some broader historical perspective on the ways in which human rights have featured in U.S. foreign policy, Professor Snyder is going to provide an overview of U.S. policy, essentially from America's Declaration of Independence through to the present day, something of a whirlwind tour in 25 minutes or so. Just to give a bit of background about our speaker, Sarah Snyder is a historian of U.S. foreign relations who specializes in the history of the Cold War, human rights activism, and U.S. human rights policy. She is the author of From Selma to Moscow, how Human Rights Activists Transformed U.S. Foreign Policy, published by Columbia University Press in 2018, as well as Human Rights Activism and the End of the Cold War, a transnational history of the Helsinki Network, published by Cambridge University Press in 2011. In addition, she has published numerous, numerous journal articles in Diplomatic History, Cold War History, Human Rights Quarterly, Diplomacy and Statecraft, the Journal of Transatlantic Studies, the European Journal of Human Rights, and the Journal of American Studies, as well as published many book chapters. I must embarrassingly confess that um, Professor Snyder's work only came to my attention fairly recently when I came across her article on Ed Koch, the former mayor of New York City, who I remember quite well from growing up in the New York area in the 1980s. Uh, but before becoming mayor, he also served in Congress where he was involved in the mid-1970s in the cutting off of American aid to the uh, dictatorship in Uruguay, uh, something I literally had no idea about before Sarah's article. And after reading that article and also coming across several others, including an excellent one on the Kennedy administration, uh, I realized I needed to invite her to speak as part of the seminar. So Professor Snyder, welcome to eBay, uh, virtually at least, and I very much look forward to your presentation, which should be loaded, loading up in just a moment. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that introduction and for the invitation to speak with all of you this evening. Um, I'm only, uh, of course, disappointed that because of COVID and, and other reasons, um, it has to be virtual instead of in person. Um, the degree to which U.S. government officials should take human rights violations and protections into account as they formulate foreign policy has prompted considerable discussion. Um, these debates have largely focused on civil and how civil and political rights overlap with the rights that are granted U.S. citizens in the Constitution, including the right to do due process and free speech and protections um, from religious persecution, as well as cruel and unusual punishment. Within the framework of a human rights policy, U.S. policymakers may weigh the human rights records of other governments as they assess decisions on military and economic assistance, um, formal and informal alliances, or high-level visits. Now, those determinations are premised on the idea that human rights are universal and thus not limited by citizenship or country of residence. Throughout its history, the U.S. government has been largely consistent in minimizing attention to human rights concerns in its foreign policy formulation. Now, the two exceptions to this low-level interest have come when championing human rights has aligned with the government's existing foreign policy priorities, or when non-governmental activists have successfully pressured the branches of the U.S. government 
to take human rights violations into greater account. So today, I want to talk about U.S. human rights policy in six distinct periods. First, I will examine U.S. efforts to create a human rights framework for the post-war world um, and the challenges that the Cold War presented to a continued focus on human rights. Second, I will outline a new approach by U.S. officials to human rights in the 1960s. Um, and I would, I would say sort of connected with that, we'll see that these years ushered in greater activism on human rights by members of Congress and non-governmental organizations. Third, in the mid to late 1970s, I think that we can identify the beginnings of a more broad-based movement for greater attention to human rights violations and efforts to address them through U.S. power, which ends up culminating to some degree with the fourth phase, the end of the Cold War in Europe. Then fifth, in the wake of the end of the Cold War, we'll talk about how the United States struggled to find a new organizing principle, such as containment, for its foreign policy agendas and the degree to which that did or did not align with protection for human rights. And then the final section will address how U.S. policymakers have struggled to balance human rights and security in the face of terror in the Bush, Obama, and Trump years. So um, as Dr. Michaels suggested, I am, I am going to begin at the beginning um, to just point out that as early as Thomas Jefferson's 1776 Declaration of Independence, Americans were discussing their rights as well as the rights of others. Thomas Jefferson wrote, quote, all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, moving forward into the 20th century, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's speeches served to popularize the concept of human rights. For example, Roosevelt said, quote, freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. Now, the United States played a significant role in shaping early practical United Nations human rights commitments. Um, although U.S. officials had begun working on an international Bill of Rights as early as 1942. Now, through former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, um, the United States made a significant contribution to the development of an international human rights regime and U.S. acceptance of such a program. But within the United States, attention to human rights questions was overtaken by worsening Soviet-American relations and the anti-communism that spread in the country in the aftermath of the war. Now, during Dwight D. Eisenhower's administration, the administration argued that it would pursue its human rights strategy through, as the Secretary of State at the time, John Foster Dulles put it, quote, persuasion, education, and example, rather than formal undertaking, such as international agreements or international treaties. And this is because of what's known as the Bricker Amendment controversy, um, which really ended U.S. engagement with international human rights for a number of years. So the Bricker Amendment was first proposed by Senator John Bricker, a Republican from Ohio, in September of 1951. And it was intended to address concerns that the president might commit the United States to international treaties that would contravene the U.S. Constitution. Now, explaining his rationale for a constitutional amendment, Bricker said in early 1952, quote, I do not want any of the international groups, especially the group headed by Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, which has drafted the covenant of human rights to betray the fundamental, inalienable, and God-given rights of American citizens enjoyed under the Constitution. Now, support for the Bricker Amendment was firmly rooted in opposition to human rights treaties and international institutions more broadly. This was a position that was shaped both by Cold War politics and by a desire to maintain racial discrimination in the United States. Now, Bricker's amendment failed to gather the necessary uh, support to become formally an amendment to the Constitution. But because of it looming over the Eisenhower administration, Eisenhower and his aides decided that they would not um, do anything to prioritize human rights because of this threat. So it's not until the 1960s that we begin to see a new approach to human rights. Now, 
From the very beginning, Kennedy signaled a rhetorical shift from the Eisenhower years. He included the term human rights in his 1961 inaugural address, declaring that new generations of Americans were, quote, unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Now, Kennedy's policies never fulfilled the promise of that speech. And part of this is because, because ongoing struggles for civil rights at home and other factors limited U.S. attention to human rights abroad. Now, this is because the high stakes of the Cold War meant that human rights considerations were often overlooked in favor of pressing national security concerns. But Kennedy did submit three UN conventions on human rights to the Senate for ratification. He paid attention to political prisoners in Cuba. He put pressure on the South Korean leader to end military rule. He imposed an arms embargo against um, the South African uh, apartheid regime. And he worked to avoid a um, declaration of independence by Southern Rhodesia that would um, serve to preserve a white minority government there. Now, in these efforts, Kennedy was primarily motivated by Cold War considerations. These cases, um, in these cases, supporting human rights closely aligned with his broader foreign policy goals. In the mid-1960s, um, the president who succeeded Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, made great strides domestically on civil rights, including the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. But I would say that internationally, his attention um, to the war in Vietnam really crowded out all other issues, which meant that human rights rarely aligned with Johnson's agenda. Now, one exception to this is the United States response to a crisis in Southern Rhodesia over that country's unilateral declaration of independence from Great Britain in 1965, which was intended to ensure the continuation of white minority rule there. In response to um, the white leader Ian Smith's declaration of independence, the United States withheld recognition of his government. It recalled the American consul there. It froze loans and credits to Smith. It imposed an embargo against shipments of military equipment and arms. And it encouraged American businesses to cease their dealings with Southern Rhodesia. Now, as with Kennedy, all of these efforts aligned with other national interests um, as, John, as the Johnson administration was really committed to um, opposing white rule in Rhodesia um, to be able to potentially attract newly independent um, African countries into the Western sphere for Cold War purposes. Now, in contrast to the Johnson approach to Rhodesia, um, in the wake of a 1967 coup in Greece, the Johnson administration did condemn the nature of the Greek regime, and it repeatedly inquired with the junta about the fate of political prisoners, but it didn't actively oppose these new leaders despite their attack on Greek democracy. Um, so clearly there's a mixed record um, in many of these administrations. And I would say that when Richard Nixon became president in 1969, his administration right away confronted a series of human rights decisions because there was growing congressional, diplomatic, and non-governmental pressure on the United States to take greater account of human rights in its foreign policy. Despite this external pressure, championing human rights really did not fit with the priorities of the Nixon administration. Um, just to give you one example, as Nixon devised his policy of detente toward the Soviet Union, he chose to minimize concerns about Soviet human rights abuses and privileged instead arms control, trade, and other agreements with the Soviets. Now, in the sort of conception of Nixon and his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, interfering on behalf of, for example, Soviet Jews would be akin to the Soviets intervening in race relations in the United States. Now, wide-scale repression in Chile in the wake of the September 1973 coup there focused many Americans, if not always those in the White House, on human rights issues in the years that followed. Now, the Chilean case captured American attention in part because of the murder of two U.S. citizens in the early days of the coup. But it also fit it also captured Americans' attention because it fit within a broader framework of the United States privileging um, right-wing violence um, over human rights in Latin America. 
Now, it's in this context um, that National Security Advisor and then Secretary of State Henry Kissinger maintained that human rights violations were internal matters in which the United States should not intervene. But an alliance between members of Congress and non-state actors um, ended up producing legislation that signaled American concerns about human rights in Chile. Um, to just give you an example of this, um, Senator Ted Kennedy, a Democrat from Massachusetts, attached an amendment to the 1976 International Security Assistance and Ex Arms Export Control Act that banned any shipment of US made uh, weapons to Chile, which effectively ended all military assistance, credits, and cash sales of military equipment to the country. And this was a very significant step by Congress to push back on the executive branch. So in the late 1960s and early 1970s, we can see that there were two factors shaping growing American attentiveness to human rights in the formulation of US foreign policy. Now, the first is congressional activism, and then the second is the influence of non-state actors, um, such as organizations devoted uh, to protecting human rights. So the growing influence of these two constituencies meant that there began to be a meaningful shift in US foreign policy formulation. So to begin with, I want to talk about what was happening in Congress, um, because this is really where the campaign for greater consideration of human rights was led. Um, and this was championed by uh, Representative Donald M. Frazier, a Democrat from Minnesota, who began publicly questioning the morality of US foreign policy in the 1960s. Now, Frazier believed that the Cold War framework inhibited consistency between American morality and the government's foreign policy. And he called for greater attention to human rights as part of an effort to build a new approach to relations with the wider world. Now, he was head of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on International Organizations and Movements. And Frazier organized a series of hearings in 1973 and ultimately on human rights. And he ultimately pressed a number of measures that forced the US government to take greater account of human rights. Now, explaining his support for human rights, Frazier suggested that by emphasizing the issue, the United States would finally be consistent with its values. His subcommittee issued a report advocating for the reorganization of the State Department to better equip it to consider human rights as an element in U.S. foreign relations. So first, his committee uh, suggested establishing an Office of Human Rights in the Bureau of International Organization Affairs. It also proposed designating a human rights officer in each regional bureau in the State Department. And third, the subcommittee urged the department to appoint an assistant legal advisor on human rights and to form an advisory commission on the issue. Now, within several months of the House subcommittee's report, the State Department had designated someone in the United Nations Political Affairs Office to be in charge of human rights, appointed an assistant legal advisor for human rights, and selected human rights officers in three regional bureaus. So there was very rapid change in response to this report. Um, but I would say that members of Congress weren't satisfied with just a bureaucratic reorganization of the State Department. They wanted to make broader changes as well. Um, and the ways that they wanted to do this was by targeting military and economic assistance that went to repressive governments. And here, as I tell the story, you'll see that there's a lot of back and forth between the legislative and executive branches over this issue. So the first step that Congress took was to pass Section 32 of the Foreign Assistance Act of 1973, which said, it is the sense of Congress that the president should deny any economic or military assistance to the government of any foreign country which practices the internment or imprisonment of that country's citizens for political purposes. Now, State Department officials criticized this language as sort of a one-time thing that they argued would not enable the United States to maintain leverage with repressive governments. And they thought that this definition of political imprisonment was too vague and unhelpful. So Congress decided that it would include far more specific language in the subsequent year's legislation. And this led to Section 502B of the 1974 Foreign Assistance Act, which said, under extraordinary circumstances, the president shall substantially reduce or terminate security assistance to any government 
which engages in a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. Those violations are defined to include torture, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, prolonged detention without charges, or other flagrant denials of the right to life, liberty, and security of person. Now, the executive branch was able to circumvent this language from 502B by determining that human rights violations might not rise to the level of gross violations, or that if there were significant human rights violations, they didn't constitute a consistent pattern. So later, and Congress ended up passing um, Section 301 of the International Security Assistance and Arms Export Control Act of 1976, which tightened the language of 502B to make reporting on countries' human rights records mandatory. And this ended up having very long lasting and significant consequences. And just to say what was happening in terms of economic assistance, this is a moment where um, Congress simultaneously passes what becomes known as the Harkin Amendment um, that prevented the extension of economic aid to governments that were engaging in gross violations of human rights unless um, such assistance will directly benefit the needy people of such country. So in the wake of this stricter legislat legislative language, the State Department and Congress began to work together more successfully on monitoring human rights abuses. Now, I mentioned there were sort of two developments here. And so now I want to shift to talking about the beginning of a non-governmental human rights movement. Um, as the human rights activist Arya Nair has put it, quote, the overwhelming majority of the world's, world's national and local organizations promoting human rights have been established since the last half of the 1970s. Now, for example, some of the organizations that he's talking about that were established in the United States in the 1970s included the Lawyers Committee for International Human Rights, which is now known as Human Rights First, and Helsinki Watch, which was the precursor to Human Rights Watch. Now, their proliferation was due in part to globalization. Um, this is because innovations in telecommunications and information technology facilitated greater non-governmental activism on human rights because human rights violations became more visible in a globalized world. But also the lower cost of international travel facilitated human rights activists' ability to engage across national and particularly across east-west borders. Also, this is a period in which private foundations, such as the Ford Foundation, increasingly began supporting human rights activism. And so there were far more financial resources at these groups' disposal. But I would say the power of these activists was limited unless they were able to link their concerns to um, priorities of US administrations. Um, now, Jimmy Carter, when he came into office, championed human rights in his speeches. And he spoke, and this was quite a change um, from some earlier administrations. And he spoke out about human rights abuses in Argentina, the Soviet Union, and Uganda. In addition to this rhetorical focus on human rights, Carter also made personnel appointments that signaled a commitment to human rights, including naming civil rights activist Patricia Darian to be the Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs. Now, most famously, Carter exchanged correspondence with the Soviet dissident Andrei Sakharov, but his actions did not stop there. In his first months in office, his um, administration produced a range of commentary on a number of Eastern European human rights cases, um, and the Carter administration also commissioned a review of U.S. human rights policy. This was uh, released in a within the government um, in July of 1977, and was known as a Presidential Review Memorandum. And it delineated the administration's focus on three types of human rights. First, um, freedom from government intervention. And this includes things like wrongful arrest, torture, false imprisonment, et cetera. Also the right to food, shelter, medical care, and education. And then finally, to civil and political rights. Now, the administration's broad articulation of human rights, I think, was quite notable because many observers have suggested that during the Cold War, Western leaders ignored social and economic rights. But we can see, at least in the Carter administration, that was not the case. The memorandum also outlined what its authors believed should be U.S. human rights strategy. And they argued that the United States should emphasize American morals and virtue, spread the rule of law, and support and expand democratization efforts in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Now, according to the memorandum's drafters, 
the Carter administration needed to be careful to not single out particular countries and instead to emphasize the broader global nature of their focus. Now, despite the policy advice that the Carter administration should adopt a balanced global approach to human rights, many contemporary and subsequent observers have criticized what they pointed to as inconsistencies in his approach. And I would say that similar to the Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford administrations, Carter was episodic in his protection of human rights internationally, and he often prioritized Cold War concerns. In particular, critics have charged that for geopolitical reasons, the Carter administration did not subject the human rights records of, for example, Romania, Cambodia, South Africa, Indonesia, and China to sufficient scrutiny. And also his complicated relations with the Shah in Iran and Anastasio Somoza in Nicaragua have also raised questions about the consistency and consequences of Carter's policy. Now Carter's successor, Ronald Reagan, criticized Carter's policy on human rights during the 1980 presidential campaign. And upon coming into office, his administration sought to transform the US approach to human rights. Reagan and his aides charged that Carter had not improved human rights and he had neglected U.S. interests. Now, in some regions, such as Central America, Reagan, the Reagan administration justified devastating human rights violations in the name of preventing the spread of communism. In other spheres, particularly in the Soviet Union and Poland, Reagan spoke forthrightly and repeatedly in defense of human rights activists and against repression in the Soviet bloc. And then there were a number of cases like South Africa, the Philippines, and Chile, where I would say that the Reagan administration's uh, stance slowly evolved to greater support for human rights. Now, with the end of the Cold War, it appeared at first, um, as the political scientist John Dietrich has written, that, quote, the end of the Cold War would finally remove all longstanding limitations on US human rights policy. And there were some early signals of a new US approach. These included heightened rhetorical attention to human rights, increased humanitarian interventions, including in the former Yugoslavia, greater participation in international treaties, and domestic legislation such as the Leahy Law, which prevented um, assistance to military units that commit gross violations of human rights. But I would say that trade, anti-terrorism, and the weakness of non-governmental actors all limited a full transformation of US human rights policy. The approach of the US government, which ignored human relations in China and Rwanda, and only acted in Bosnia when its reputation was threatened there, shows that US human rights policy is actually quite consistent regardless of the Cold War context. Just to give you some examples of this, specifically, George, US President George H.W. Bush was reluctant to react to the brutal suppression of demonstrators in China's Tiananmen Square in June of 1989. In the aftermath of the Chinese crackdown, his objective was to disavow Chinese actions, but without sacrificing the overall Sino-American relationship. But many members of Congress, the American public, and international leaders wanted more far-reaching sanctions than Bush was willing to impose. And controversially, members of the Bush administration traveled to China the subsequent month in secret raising questions about the degree to which the Bush administration was truly concerned about China's crackdown. Shifting to Yugoslavia, as that country disintegrated in the 1990s, nearly 300,000 people were killed. But the new administration of Bill Clinton struggled to formulate an approach to Bosnia, which his Secretary of State Warren Christopher described as the problem from hell. The United States began to focus more intently on Bosnia um, in the wake of the murder of over 7,000 Muslims uh, in the UN safe haven of Srebrenica in July of 1995. Now, the following month, there was a devastating attack on a market in Sarajevo, which drew further attention to Western inaction. These two attacks together made the United States and NATO look impotent, and it, they finally led to more forceful action. NATO bombardment um, was seen as essential to maintaining NATO and the United States' credibility um, and this bombardment ultimately pushed the two sides to negotiate. And so in November of 1995, after 20 days of nonstop negotiation at the Dayton Air Force Base in Ohio, all sides finally reached a peace agreement. 
Um, and I just want to briefly mention that in the span of several months, in the spring and summer of 1994, in Rwanda, a small country in southern Africa, there was a staggering genocide. As many as one million Rwandans were killed. But the United States did not intervene to stop the violence there because acting to arrest the killings was not seen as aligning with the Clinton administration's policies. Now I want to shift to U.S. efforts to, um, to protect human rights in the wake of the war on terror. So the, the terrorist attacks on September 11th, 2001 shattered any remaining hopes that the end of the Cold War might usher in a new U.S. approach to human rights in its foreign policy. As the country came to terms with nearly 3,000 deaths, George W. Bush, Bush's administration developed a multi-pronged approach, including what Vice President Dick Cheney um, described as a willingness to work on the, quote, dark side. Therefore, under the second Bush administration, the United States became a violator of human rights. As part of the administration's response to the attacks, the Office of Legal Counsel determined that the Geneva Convention protections did not apply to the Taliban, Al Qaeda, or other terrorists held in captivity. And it's in this context um, that the office defined torture as an act that causes pain akin in intensity to the pain accompanying serious physical injury, such as organ failure, impairment of bodily function, or even death. Now, using this determination, interrogators at the U.S. detention facility in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, were given permission to use what were called enhanced counter-resistance strategies that included waterboarding or the use of a wet towel and dripping water to induce the perception of suffocation. In addition, the United States subjected ter suspected terrorists to what was called extraordinary rendition, which transferred them to foreign governments, including those known to torture suspects. They also sent detainees to secret prisons that were often referred to as black sites. So over Bush's two terms, US human rights policy became increasingly controversial. And I think it's notable that in contrast to previous administrations, in Bush's case, it was the US's own human rights abuses, rather than its support for foreign governments engaging in human rights violations, that was the central concern. The lack of due process afforded the detainees the use of torture against prisoners in Guantanamo Bay, and the indefinite nature of these detentions made the prison a target for human rights activists, legal scholars, and critics of the U.S. war on terror. Now, shortly after his inauguration, Barack Obama and his aides announced a new approach to human rights, including the closure of the CIA's secret prison network, an expressed commitment to the Geneva Convention, adherence to the military's interrogation rules, that did not allow the use of torture, and a promise to close the detention center at Guantanamo Bay. But Obama did not succeed in closing the prison, and indeed it still exists today, which led some disappointed observers to say that the change in Obama's approach to human rights was far more rhetorical than grounded in reality. Now, furthermore, the expansion of the US drone warfare program led to the deaths of many innocent civilians over Obama's two terms. Now, during the Trump years, the president and his first secretary of state, Rex Tillerson, sent many signals that they saw the protection of human rights as potentially compromising U.S. national security. Under the leadership of his second secretary of state, Mike Pompeo, however, the administration pursued selective attention to human rights, largely focusing on the issue of religious freedom. Pompeo elevated the Office of International Religious Freedom, and he repeatedly held ministerial meetings on the issue. But overall, I would say that that administration politicized attention to human rights. Now, Biden said during the campaign, um, as Dr. Um, Michaels mentioned earlier, that human rights would be at the core of U.S. foreign policy. And he has already worked to reverse a number of Trump era measures, including uh, the U.S. withdrawal from the U.N. Human Rights Council. The United States has rejoined. Um, he disbanded Pompeo's Commission on Unalienable Rights. And he's also redirected attention to women's rights issues in the State Department's annual human rights country reports. So to conclude, examining U.S. attention to human rights in its foreign policy in the years since 1945 demonstrates a slow and growing consideration of the issue. But this growing consideration, I argue, was largely fueled by external pressure from members of Congress, NGOs, and concerned citizens. 
but U.S. presidents and their aides increasingly had to evaluate human rights considerations when making decisions about foreign assistance, rhetorical support or condemnation, or more forceful actions such as military intervention. Perhaps not surprisingly, the U.S. government has rarely prioritized human rights unless doing so aligned with other policy objectives. But I think that by studying U.S. human rights policy formulation, it illuminates the means by which activists can shape the United States and other governments' approaches. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. I mean, it really covers so much, um, so much ground and, and, and did it in such a short space of time. So uh, very impressive uh, for that alone. Can I just touch on sort of begin? I mean, I have a, I have a whole series of questions to, 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 to get to, but I'd like to start with, uh, as you mentioned, the 67 coup in Greece. And it sort of got me thinking about, uh, you know, because Greece is a member of NATO and perhaps uh, this question about alliance commitments and so forth, you know, be more important than the human rights issue, but actually going back much earlier to the founding of NATO and this question uh, on the one hand, because it had to deal with the Salazar regime in Portugal, uh, which was obviously very, very controversial uh, given their human rights record, but also uh, not actually inviting Spain into NATO. Now, I assume with Spain, it was more because Franco, it wasn't just about the human rights issue, it was also about the fascism issue, uh, perhaps. Well, more. and and Spain doesn't have the Azores. And there's the Azores issue, so perhaps, but at the time, uh, uh, you know, I mean, if you go back to, say, the late 1940s, one of the, um, the key U.S. interests in Spain from a military perspective was actually the Pyrenees. This was a very good place to retreat to if you had to, and so fall back behind the Pyrenees and try to come up with a defense line. I mean, so, I mean, like from a strategic perspective, I could see there was that rationale at the time. Um, although, as it happened, one reason why that rationale was opposed had nothing to do with human rights. It was because the French were opposed uh, on the grounds that uh, it implied that the U.S. would actually retreat after they've already lost France and actually try to defend Spain instead. So France would be overrun in, in that scenario. Um, so it wasn't very positive. But it was sort of raised that point in terms of you know, human rights in relation to the NATO allies. But if I could just sort of press you one related issue has to do with what you referred uh, when you referred to section 32 of the foreign assistance act from 73 as well as uh, section 502b from 74 I was, I was very curious in terms of whether it was criticism of uh, u.s policy towards the south vietnamese government that motivated that at all because if you go back to uh, that period. I mean, certainly President Tu in South Vietnam, uh, you know, and his 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 regime, uh, you know, engaged in all sorts of torture, uh, which was sort of fairly well known, and I think became even more well known after the U.S. left um, South Vietnam after the '73 uh, Paris Accords. But I was just sort of wondering your 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 views of, uh, in the first instance, uh, human rights. And NATO and also human rights with regards to the Vietnam War, if I could uh, sort of put it in those terms. Sure. So I'll start with the question on Vietnam. Um, in my research for From Selma to Moscow, I expected there to be a stronger connection between the human rights violations of the South Vietnamese government and American human rights activism. And I really only um, saw it playing a meaningful role, I think, in kind of um, activating Tom Harkin, um, who um, is, you know, the, the namesake of the Harkin Amendment. But um, at the time, um, he, I mean, we could never say that sort of Americans discovered something, but he brought to greater international and American attention um, what were known as the tiger cages, these sort of incredibly inhuman um, detention cells for South Vietnamese political prisoners. Um, when he was a congressional aide. And this um, seems to have been something that was quite important in his own human rights journey. But I think that because Americans um, were so upset about, about the Vietnam War in a much broader sense, um, that the real way that it ended up shaping U.S. attention to human rights was, a, was that it, it opened the window 
for Americans to question the Cold War consensus. And it made acceptable to ask questions about who the United States was funding, who the United States was fighting alongside. And so I see that I see that aspect of Vietnam as actually being far more significant than the specifics of the human rights violations in South Vietnam, which was something that was surprising to me in my research. Um, in terms of the question of NATO, um, it was quite interesting to me when I when I began researching uh, from Selma to Moscow, I had a very, I was collecting documents in a very broad way. Um, and I thought, you know, the first research I did was at the Johnson right, in Austin, Texas. And I just had a list of countries where I knew that there were human rights violations taking place. And I wanted to see what kind of commentary there was. And two countries on my list were, were Portugal and Spain. And I was shocked to discover that there was I think there was one document maybe on Spain and nothing on Portugal, which was really surprising to me. And so I began realizing that um, what I needed to focus on was the countries that Americans were concerned about and and not kind of project my own conceptions of, say, there were terrible human rights violations in China. Let's see what what Americans were were asking about that. And I think that some of it um, is about the NATO alliance, um, which certainly the United States privileges over um, asking countries about their individual human rights records. And um, this definitely comes up um, with Portugal uh, in the 1970s as it tries to hold on to its colonies. Um, the United States is increasingly uncomfortable both with the denial of self-determination as well as the means by which um, Portugal is trying to repress these national liberation movements. And one thing I did see a lot of was um, documents sort of delineating, you can use this military equipment for NATO activities in Portugal, but don't let us discover that you're waging war in Angola or, or somewhere else with US military equipment. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a very, um, curious way of, of thinking about the fungibility of military equipment. Um, but I, I see the issue coming up um, with Portugal, with Greece, um, later in the 1980s with Turkey. Um, but I, I really think that it's not just that the United States is sort of privileging its alliance. It's that there's a lack of activism on these issues um, because there were some instances with Greece where, say, Congress tried to cut off funding to the junta because um, because they disagreed with what U.S. policy was. They weren't somehow saying, "Oh no, no, we have to we have to keep U.S. Um, ships being able to be stationed there." And so I I think it that the alliance issue is important, but I think the lack of of political pressure on these issues is actually what potentially drives U.S. policy even more. And I was wondering if you could say something about, because I mean, you mentioned um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt. So I was wondering if I should go back slightly earlier to Theodore Roosevelt, because um, sort of I vaguely recall that uh, I think it was in 1903 or something like this, there were some pogroms in, I think it was Moldova, mm -hmm. or present day Moldova anyway. Uh, which uh, he objected to or sent some very angry letter to the czar at the time. I was wondering if you could say something about sort of pre-World War II, if there was much interest in this issue. I mean, I was sort of just amazed you know, that this comes up in the course of a, um, uh, in the course of uh, Roosevelt's diplomatic dealings with, with the czar, uh, you know, that that would even be an issue at that early stage. Um, so do you even see much sort of either before that or sort of after that, but prior to the Second World War? You definitely see um, American concerns. I'm, I'm thinking about American concerns of, of Spanish repression of Cubans in the eight, 1890s. Um, you certainly see Americans who are concerned about a range of pogroms in the Russian Empire. Um, some of that, I think, is based on sort of shared um, religious or national identity. 
um, you know, these pogroms end up um, spurring a lot of immigration to the United States. And so you have people who are um, individually um, and collectively invested in what's happening there. So you do see cases of American policymakers commenting on these issues. I think probably from my own research, where I see a greater um, uptick of interest um, comes with the Armenian genocide um, during World War I, where um, the US ambassador to Constantinople, um, New Morgenthau, um, wrote repeatedly um, about what was happening there and, and ultimately um, you know, quit in frustration because he wasn't able to have any impact um, on preventing the violence there. And I think that um, for those Americans who are disappointed in the US non-ratification of the Versailles Treaty and therefore um, not joining the League of Nations, I think there had been a hope that that would be a vehicle to offer greater protection. Um, I mean, very often within human rights, we talk about this as a period where people are thinking about the rights of groups or the rights of minorities, and that in the 1940s, there's greater attention to the rights of individuals. And I do think that there were many Americans who hoped that the League of Nations might offer protection to religious or national minorities um, and greater protection of their human rights. But the, the sort of formal institutionalization of those concerns doesn't come until much later. Sure. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the Armenian genocide uh, just, just a moment ago. You referred in your presentation towards the end to the Rwandan uh, genocide, although this was a, um, a word that wasn't used, I believe, at the time by the Clinton administration. And I just well, very it, deliberately. Yes, quite, quite deliberately, yes, um, despite much criticism, as I recall at the time. Uh, but more recently, as in sort of very recently, we've, there's been a lot of controversy over the term genocide in relation to the Uyghurs uh, in the U.S. We've seen uh, when, um, I believe it was when Secretary of State's uh, designate Blinken was in front of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee being uh, sort of approved for his job, confirmed in, in, in his job, that he was asked this question about whether China was uh, committing gen genocide against the Uyghurs, I think it was by uh, Marco Rubio uh, or something like that. But but the question I have for you is that you know the Uyghur issue has been around you know this idea of prejudice, uh, if not genocide, against uh, the Uyghurs. This has been around for a very long time. But you know in terms of how it's talked about in Washington, you know is it is it just the increase in geopolitical competition? I mean I'll, I'll deliberately not refer to the U.S. China relationship as a, as, a, as a Cold War, you know, is he only caring about it now because it's useful to do so, that it's embarrassing for China? And, you know, I sort of relate this, you know, is this an observable phenomenon more generally and historically? In other words, when adversaries do it, you know, we complain about it, when allies do it, less so. I'm just sort of wondering about your thoughts on that. So I would say it's not generalizable that the United States complains less about its allies' human rights records. Um, and this was one of the significant criticisms of the Carter administration um, from the, the Reagan team during the campaign and as it came in, was that um, Carter only put pressure from their perspective on US allies. And the Carter administration would say, well, those are the countries we were giving military and economic assistance to. And that was the easiest way to try and change their human rights records was by decreasing or removing that assistance. Um, so I think that if you think about how the United States can change foreign government's practices, there's often the greatest leverage with those countries with whom the United States has a relationship with, um, because human rights can often be used as sort of one issue in an interlocking web of issues that, that both countries um, want to, to achieve or, or improve relations on. In terms of um, specifically the case of China, you know, one thing that is, um, so uh, Arya Nair, the, the human rights activist who I mentioned in the talk, he wrote a piece in the Clinton years um, that I think could be generalizable to more, um, certainly to the Obama years, that the United States in the Clinton years was only criticizing the human rights records of weak countries. So it wasn't about allies or not allies, but um, countries who didn't necessarily have the might to push back against the United States. Um, 
from my perspective, when Obama came into office, he was rightly uh, very focused on the, the US economic situation um, and the, the Great Recession that the United States was facing. And because of China's growing economic power um, and particularly its potential leverage over the United States in that respect, um, I believe that, that the Obama administration was far less willing to criticize China on human rights um, because it no longer felt as though um, China was a weak power that it could criticize without potential significant consequences. I think that the Trump administration really flipped that on its head um, because it said no longer do we need to be um, accommodating a powerful China, but we need to recognize the threat that, that China poses to the United States. And because of this growing adversarial relationship, which I agree with you um, that we are not in a new Cold War with China, but I think that this unbridled US policymakers to make criticisms that they might otherwise have only been making privately. I also think it's, um, there's no um, sort of coincidence that this is an issue around religious freedom um, because it is such an issue um, that Pompeo and his um, sort of uh, the in evangelicals um, that support him and, and who, um, you know, he's a, a key um, political leader in their community. Um, they care a lot about um, the repression of, of Christians internationally. And I think that um, they recognize that it, it's a more salient issue if you talk about religious freedom overall. And so I think that that's, there's sort of all of these things that are aligning together um, that made that a safe and popular human rights issue for um, Pompeo and others in the Trump administration to be talking about. So one question I have is, you know, as pushing for human rights seems to have been in, in many of these historical cases that you mentioned earlier, uh, in a sense, an uphill battle, um, you know, and also sort of on very specific issues or, you know, to free a political prisoner here or there. So, you know, it might be this country or that country or political prisoner here or there, which is to say, you know, one cannot really expect much change, but change can still happen. Can you perhaps offer your views on the best strategies to employ to get action that have been employed in the past and resulted in some positive change, as well as strategies that have failed to lead to a change in, in policy or to get the US to put pressure on a foreign government? So I would say that during the Cold War and perhaps beyond, one of the biggest debates has been about sort of quiet diplomacy or we never really talk about the other one. I don't think it's called loud diplomacy, but audible diplomacy might be a way to think about it. Um, with people like Nixon and Kissinger arguing that they could accomplish much more um, with quiet diplomacy, exerting private pressure on governments to change their human rights practices. And what we know now is that indeed, uh, this was not quiet diplomacy, but very often non-existent diplomacy. Um, and so I think there are, there are a few reasons that, that people are very cautious about this idea. One is that um, you can claim you're engaging in quiet diplomacy and clearly do nothing, um, which doesn't advance human rights at all internationally. Um, and two, we've heard from many um, dissidents, um, people who were formerly in prison, that international attention to their plight improved their conditions. Um, there were many people at the time who would say, oh, this might give them worse treatment in prison, or this might somehow extend their time in prison. Um, and what they've said is that, no, there were clear um, interventions where, say, they got access to medical care, or they were able to receive a letter from their family because governments realized that the international community, and, and I'm not saying just you know the US president or the secretary of state, but very often members of letter writing groups from Amnesty International writing directly to the head of a prison where one of their adopted prisoners um, was being held, that that type of international attention could improve their situations. So I think that um, it's clear that across the levels at which someone might be a human rights activist, um, that doing that, it, sorry, trying to exert pressure in as public a way as possible seems to have really positive impacts. Um, in terms of other methods that have been successful 
or not. Um, it does seem like connecting progress on human rights to other issues. Um, this is something the Reagan administration did with the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Um, George Shultz developed what he called a, a four point agenda for every meeting that he or any other US official had with the Soviets. Uh, and they always discussed human rights so that it became a regular part of their negotiations. Um, and through this, the United States um, was able to encourage the Soviets um, to undertake a number of steps, both kind of at the individual level and at the broader societal level um, to ensure greater respect for human rights. And it seems that people like Gorbachev and the Soviet foreign minister at the time, Edward Shepard Nodzet, were willing to do this because they saw that there were, you know, they weren't just sort of being bow, brow beaten by the by the United States, that it was part of building a relationship of trust, of re-entering into the world community, and that there were real benefits um, that the United States was offering if the Soviet Union took these steps. So those are the two things that um, that I sort of see across my research as being effective in changing human rights practices. And I've got one final question for you, and, th and this is less a historical question. It's more, um, in a sense, it's a personal question about part of, you know, in terms of your own experience teaching this issue and your impressions of, for example, what your students think about U.S. foreign policy in relation to human rights when they come into the classroom for the very first time. I mean, one thing that always struck me was, yeah, you know, I didn't know a lot about this stuff. I was never really taught about it. Uh, certainly not in high school, even college was a bit of a stretch, at least my undergraduate degree. But I'm sort of just generally curious about how does one explain the, do you think you explain the dissonance between the rhetoric uh, and reality, I mean, uh, of, of U.S. foreign policy in relation to human rights? I mean, on the one hand, you know, that the U.S. supports human rights would seem to be a fairly straightforward uh, message, both, the, you know, domestically as well as international audiences, you know, the only other options would be to say the U.S. does not support human rights, which would be kind of odd, or to, or you know, or they could simply say nothing, uh, or to say the you know the U.S. supports human rights but then ignores it in practice. But you know, domestically speaking, uh, sorry, from from, from from a domestic perspective, you know, to what extent do you find that this that there is an understanding that uh, the U.S. does not have a very good record on this issue? Um, I'm just sort of just generally curious from your perspective as as an educator, um, what do your students know when they come into class? So I, I have a, a few ways to answer that. And I'll start with um, a bit of a sort of generational um, element. And that is that at this point, um, all of my undergraduate students and many of my master's students have been born after or have no memory of 9-11. So they have, for their entire lives, lived in an era in which the United States has held ind indefinitely detained people at Guantanamo, um, in which the use of torture has been actively debated within American society. Um, and so I think for them, the reality of the US human rights record is much more stark um, than say for you and I who grew up in a, in a different era in the United States. So I think that's part of it is I don't, some of these things are not, they're not revelations to them, right? They've seen the film Zero Dark Thirty or, or they've read about the Senate report on the use of torture. One thing that I think is um, often surprises them is that um, in the classes that I teach that are specifically on human rights, I think they, they all think we're gonna get to Carter and then magically things will be okay. Um, and then we talk about Carter's um, pretty much ignoring of the Cambodian genocide and overlooking human rights abuse, mass, massive human rights abuses in Indonesia or um, you know, with the Shah in Iran. And I think that that, that really maybe um, kind of punctures their illusions more than anything because they believed that Carter was the human rights president and in many ways he was but he like most u.s presidents and indeed all u.s presidents i argued in the talk um has to balance a lot of complicated issues and therefore isn't necessarily prioritizing human rights at all times um i felt like there was one other thing that i had wanted to say in response to that 
Um, yeah, no, no, no worries. Actually, as it, as it happens, um, uh, I think it was actually reading either a short book or an article by Chomsky on the on, on precisely on the Carter administration and the human rights issue, essentially making the points that you were making uh, just a moment ago that actually sort of first got me more interested in this um, in this topic, really seeing things in a slightly uh, different way from my original impressions, uh, because you often had certainly Republicans always complaining about Carter was being too too pro-human rights and, 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 and things like this. Um, mm -hmm. Incidentally, I just came across not too long ago, uh, because I've been doing some research on the foreign policy of the president-elect, or president-elects, uh, presidents-elect, um, looking at the transition from Carter to Reagan. And during that transition, some of Reagan's um, transition officials actually making comments to the effect that you know, human rights is no longer going to be an issue in US foreign policy in the, in the coming administration. And this led to some people, uh, I believe, being killed in, I can't remember which country it was, maybe Ecuador, uh, somewhere in South America. Uh, yeah, Argentina is often a place that's pointed to. Yes, uh, that, um, that these comments basically said, we're not going to take uh, you know, military dictatorships and so forth to task for committing, committing human rights violations. But this actually happened uh, while Carter was still president um, at the time. But anyway, mm. uh, so, as we've uh, afraid, reached 7 p.m. here, I'm afraid I will need to bring this session to a close. Uh, Professor Snyder, thank you so much for a you know, really superb presentation, which I found quite fascinating and, and, and really a superb overview that not only covered a great span of time, but also engaged with so many of the key uh, dilemmas, controversies, personalities associated with this topic. Um, you know, at the very least, I know that I've got quite a few revisions to do. Uh, prior to teaching again on human rights and U.S. foreign policy, but you know, and I really do mean making revisions in a positive sense. Um, before leaving, I would like to briefly remind uh, everyone that the next session in this series will take place on the 14th of December with Professor Michelle Murray uh, discussing status as a driver of U.S. foreign policy. I look forward to seeing you on 14th of December and wishing all of you a pleasant remainder of the uh, day and evening. Uh, Sarah, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This is a lot of fun.